Stanley presents, oh, hey, that's me, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, Excelsior. Welcome. It's time for The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Some of the greatest adventures of my life are sitting in this museum. Big deal. Pack your bag. Grab your passport and prepare to go globetrotting with Dark Horse Comics' classic four-color adventures of Indiana Jones. Oh, your teacher. Part time. Mr. Henry Jones Jr. of Princeton, New Jersey. I like Indiana. We're named the Dog Indiana. Now, what shall we talk about? Well, welcome, IndieCast listeners and further fans to the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. I'm Joe Stuber. Joined, as always, by my podcasting partner and counterpart in Austria, Keith Voss. Keith, we love our anniversaries here, but man, 10 years of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. This one kind of sneaked up on us, didn't it? It sure did. And you know what that means? If it's 10 years of Crystal Skull, that means it's 29 years since Last Crusade, which is just (laughs) crazy. (laughs) Thanks for making me feel really, really old now. Do you feel old now, Joe? Yeah, I feel feel old. old It's not the years, it's the mileage. Well, as as we'll find out, it's not the mileage, it's the years. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Something that was left out of the the film, but it was included in the adaptation, which is what we're going to talk about a little later. But, I mean, what does Kingdom of the Crystal Skull mean to you besides being a film in the Indiana Jones franchise? I, look, we, we've talked about this on the IndieCast a lot. It's uh, Some people love it, some people hate it. I don't think any movie has generated as much controversy in the world of Indiana Jones or in the Indiana Jones community as this one has. But, you know, I just... Uh, oh, since Ed had mentioned it on the last IndieCast, I've kind of been thinking about that, you know, what what wouldn't we have without Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? I made my I, list. Uh, I've got a couple things here. First of all, we, we wouldn't have the brilliant John Williams score. Uh, yes. which to me is one of the most listenable scores uh, he's ever put out. I can put this thing on beginning to end. I love it. It's one of his best. He plays Mutt's theme in concert all the time, so he loves it. Um, and then if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark live, the, you know, he goes to city to city, the different uh, orchestras playing live to the movie. At the intermission, it's The Adventures of Mutt. So, it's you know, it's, it's beloved uh, by... Williams, by all those parties that put together these these concerts. Um, We've got the tie-in from the feature films to the Indiana Jones Chronicles. That's canon now. We've got that. That is canon. That's right. Um, Nuke the Fridge. We've uh, that's been added to the lexicon. (laughs) Well, you know my stand on that. You know, you know why I give that one a pass. (laughs) We've talked about that a few times. I give Nuke the Fridge a pass because look, when Indiana Jones drank from the Grail. Okay, granted, he did not have eternal life. You know, they crossed the seal. All that stuff was negated, whatever. But when he drank, everything in his body was healed. Remember that one time we were watching Last Crusade and he came out and I said, hey, you notice all of his wounds are gone? You had never noticed that before. All, everything was gone. Everything was healed. His body, he was like a young like a young man, yeah. like he was just completely rejuvenated. He so his Wolverine. bones were, he became Wolverine. Exactly. <laughs> he was, his bones were nice and strong, you know? Um, so yeah. I give nuke the fridge a pass. He's Indiana Jones. The guy's fallen out of a plane on a, yeah. on a rubber raft a and superhero. has survived. He is a super, he's, he's outrun boulders. He's, he's, you know, he's had uh, his heart almost torn out. He's fallen from bridges. This yeah. guy is, I mean, come on. He, he's the ultimate adventurer. You got to give that, somewhat of a pass but we all got tired of saying jump the shark so now we can say nuke the fridge so we got to say nuke the fridge yeah so you can't you know you wouldn't have that without indy 4 um you can't have indy 5 without indy 4 so we're all like oh can't wait for indy 5 well you wouldn't have that without indy 4 so hey you couldn't uh, have last crusade without temple of doom you know for a lot of people people don't like temple of doom so i you know you could you you can't have last crusade without temple of doom so you got to maybe see it in that way as well. We got the wrap up of the Indy Marion story, which we never had. We were always like, "What happened to Marion? Why wasn't she in Last Crusade?" And you know, we got the return of Karen Allen, uh, who had some great scenes, some great lines in this movie. So, and you know, obviously, and we'll talk about uh, coming up here the you know the wedding scene at the end. But um, so we have that, and of course, I don't think we would have had the Indy cast yes. without. <laughs> Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Think about all that's got all the friendships that it's created. Yep. Uh, I mean, so many. You know, we've we've met up and had all kinds of different adventures ourselves. 
And then everybody else that listens to the IndieCast, they, they've had different friendships and they're meeting up at you know Disneyland and all these different places. Uh, so I don't think we would have had that. We wouldn't have had 10 years last Absolutely. year of the IndieCast. And think about, we wouldn't have had the further adventures of Indiana Jones on the IndieCast. <laughs> that is absolutely right. By, yeah, by I mean, extension. You know, right. I mean, I totally, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you because when, when Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was uh, just about to come out, I had just moved uh, to Austria and, you know, I was so excited that a fourth, the fourth indie movie was finally happening. And I was so excited about it that I was looking around for podcasts. That's how I found the IndieCast. That's how, uh, you know, I, I initially... Um, started listening and then eventually, you know, getting in touch with like, you know, Pat, the you know, trivia guy and you and Ed and of course, you know, Mitch, everybody, all, all the, you know, the entire IndieCast crew, that all came from just my love of the fact that the movie was going to come out, you know, whether or not I, I totally loved it or not, that, that it doesn't matter. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's absolutely the catalyst of what, you know, started the IndieCast, of course, and what brought us all together. And here we are, uh, 70 episodes of uh, Further Adventures in. I, I don't even know how many uh, of the IndieCast. I mean, 10 years later, here we all are. Yeah. Um, it's, and, it's incredible. And doesn't it seem just like yesterday that it was the fifth anniversary of Crystal Skull and we were, oh, we yeah. were, we were taking the Crystal Skull tour with Mitch and – uh, knocking back some warm crystal head, triple Herkimer diamond filtered Newfoundland deep aquifer pure spirit vodka. In a Connecticut comic book shop recording an episode of Further Adventures with Mitch. Uh, you can go, if you haven't heard that, you can go back and listen to it. But man, that just seems like yesterday. Yeah, it really does. Um, I mean, well, yeah, what a great day that was. What a great day that was. I it mean, was. we we laughed so much. There were so many moments that we still bring up today. Last time when we saw all saw each other yeah. uh, in Times Square, we were talking about you know walking into that diner, um, <laughs> not, not not the diner in 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 Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but another diner in New Haven, Connecticut. No, and, but and probably and same results. There's a whole near, story about the same, results, same yeah. results. There was almost a big fist fight in there. No, no, no. Oh, uh, but but I mean, just every single time we meet up it's oh, the, just the, the dude at the university is like you guys have jobs <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, we were all just standing there you know in, in awe you know, oh this is where you know that this scene was shot and you know, yeah that, was, yeah, a that was hilarious it was yeah. just a great day and it just really brought um you know all of us a bit closer you know we all live so far away um and and you know it brought us all a bit closer together yeah. had a had a wonderful time and that's all because of really the indie cast which in turn is all because of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which is all in turn because of Indiana Jones. Yeah, I mean so that's, that's our love years. for the character. Yeah, had love for the character, and I mean, we love the movie. I mean, we love it. It's yeah. look if it's on, I'm watching it. So that that's simple as that. Uh, so happy 10th anniversary to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, okay, now if people are tuning in. They're probably like, "Why aren't they talking about pirates? Why aren't they talking about Sargasso Pirates?" Well, okay, we've we've been promising Sargasso Pirates review uh, as we come up. That's coming. We, we but you know when when we saw oh wait a minute we're gonna be everybody's gonna be celebrating Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. We knew we had to put a comic book spin on this party. Like Absolutely. we knew we had to do that. So we kind of like shifted things around. Our, our full review of of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the comic book adaptation, that's gonna come up whenever we get to it chronologically. Uh, but we wanted something special for this anniversary. And Keith, what better way to celebrate but than by sitting down in the Raven's Nest at the VIP table with a special guest today? That's right. That special guest is none other than John Jackson Miller. Uh, you, I mean, you're you're Indiana Jones fans. That means you're probably Star Wars fans. That means you've you've heard of him probably before if you collect Star Wars comics. He's best known for his work on Dark Horse Star Wars comics and the novel Star Wars Kenobi. If you if you haven't read that, I mean, it's you know it's out of canon now, quote unquote. But still, give that a read. That's a fantastic book, an amazing adventure with Obi Wan Kenobi. A western, uh, he's done Star a Trek. Kobe, yeah. Kenobi Western. It, it's a Kenobi <laughs> Western. Which if if they do make a, a spinoff, that's probably the direction they're going to go yeah um uh he has, he's also done some star trek novels the star mm -hmm. trek prey trilogy of novels and of course i mean you you would know this of course you were mr comic book central yeah. the 13 issue run on iron man and of course the indiana jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull comic book adaptation from dark horse yeah lots of great stuff to talk about with john jackson miller today hey let's why waste any more time let's get it the drinks are flowing the celebration is in full force let's head on into the raven's nest to talk about skulls aliens and Indiana Jones with our special guest. Oh, 
Well, Keith, joining us at the VIP table right here in the Raven's Nest is a prolific author who has inhabited the worlds of Star Wars, Star Trek, and, of course, our favorite archaeologist adventure. A big welcome to John Jackson Miller. John, welcome to the IndieCast. Welcome to the Raven's Nest. Hey, glad to be here. Happy 10th anniversary, Crystal Skull. <laughs> it's been 10 ah, years. <laughs> 10 years of Crystal Skull. Can't believe it. Drinks on the house. Drinks on the house. Yeah, right, right? <laughs> time flies. <laughs> Whatever you are want. We you drinking, are, we, are we drinking the Crystal Skull vodka? Is that what we're doing? Uh, Is, only, we if gonna... it's, only if it's warm. I think that's the only way <laughs> Keith and I are allowed to drink Crystal Skull vodka oh, if it's warm. Goodness. I know. There's a whole story there. Uh, look, John, certainly a lot of Star Wars fans listening uh, to this interview right now. Um, you've published... Many stories from that universe, of course, including the epic novel Kenobi. So if anyone wants to low down on your Star Wars tales, I think there's probably about a thousand Star Wars podcasts out there. Um, yeah, I, I think this is the first indie podcast yes. ever, which is uh, which is uh, yeah, pretty cool, actually. <laughs> I was curious. Yeah. Keith and I were talking about this. We were curious. Like, have you ever done an interview just based upon Indiana? Because I know you've done like a billion Star Wars ones. No, and, and what's funny is I have plenty of Indiana Jones stories, uh, not that I've written, but that yes. I can you know, refer to. I mean, I was just tweeting yesterday about uh, my uh, my shattering experience that I had with uh, with Temple of Doom back in college. Uh, oh, wow. well, that's well, Keith's we, we, favorite. We might, need, we might need to hear that story. Uh, look, just tell, <laughs> tell us now. We're, look, we're, we're oh, in well, the right time well, place. There, somebody, somebody had, uh, there was some sort of a meme being tweeted about uh, you know, is there a movie that you would watch for 24 hours straight for a million dollars? And of course, that sounds like really easy work for a million dollars to me. But <laughs> I, I, I recalled that. Uh, uh, well, uh, of course, when uh, when my real Indiana Jones fandom uh, was going on, it was 1984, 85. I was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the Star Wars was done. Uh, I, Star Trek: The Next Generation had not started yet. Uh, and uh, Indiana Jones uh, and uh, the the uh, uh, and now I've forgotten the name of the movie. Uh, oh, Temple of Doom. No, <laughs> I think Temple Doom. Keith, I think Keith found a new friend. I think this yes. story is going right <laughs> where Keith wants it to go. Uh, the, 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 anyway, what happened is the Temple of Doom came out, and uh, I I got heavily uh, into uh, the movie. And uh, in fact, one of, even though I don't write and have never written uh, you know fan fiction. I had my own novel that I was working on, which was sort of an Indiana Jones guy in it. It was that kind of an adventure. Uh, and, uh, and of course, later on, I would reshape that into a, a pitch for Dark Horse that I never actually sent uh, for Indiana Jones. But anyway, uh, uh, it, it, so I was heavily into indie then, uh, had the role-playing game, had everything. And uh, then advance, oh, I guess it's uh, three or four years to... Uh, when I'm in college, I'm a sophomore. I have gone through uh, a series of really, really bad roommates in my dormitory. <laughs> and every one of them was raw, a, a, a bad roommate for a different reason. Uh, there was uh, the final roommate is somebody that we uh, we nicknamed Mooch. And I thought that Mooch would be uh, <laughs> no, no relation to Scaramucci. No, uh, no, no, of course uh, we, we, nicknamed, we nicknamed him Mooch because his deal was that he would eat your food uh yeah. I, I would i would go away for the weekend and you know all of my stuff would be out of the refrigerator and there would be an iou in there uh it, that he would never <laughs> never buy anyway uh, uh the poor guy uh at some point uh that semester uh his parents moved away and didn't tell him where they were going wow and, they really did not like him <laughs> <laughs> and so and so he he had no money for tuition for the next year. He was already flunking out anyway. Uh, so we get down to finals before Christmas and he's decided, you know what? He's not going to take his finals. He's not going to do anything. He's almost completely out of money. Uh, and he, he he's, he, he's down to his last two dollars. And so the night that I am studying for my finals, pulling an all nighter, he spends his last two dollars at the video rental store. Remember those? Yeah, yeah. For, yeah. A oh, yes. for a copy of Indiana Jones and the and uh, and the Temple of Doom. Be kind, rewind. For, for twenty four hours. Well, he rewound it twelve <laughs> times because oh, he said he wow. said he said, "Damn it, I'm going to get my money's worth out of this." <laughs> and so he watched the movie wow. on my TV and my VCR wow. again and again and again and. 
you know, around about three o'clock, I was starting to wear thin on my fandom for the movie. <laughs> about 5 a.m., I was longing for the release that death would bring. Uh, <laughs> you were hoping and, Mola Ram would rip your heart out, is, what you're, is what you're telling me. <laughs> and I'm surprised that I did not actually mention Mola Ram in whatever history final I was writing the essay for. Are you able to day. listen to Anything Goes at all at this point, or is that I just uh, nails on a chalkboard? I, I cannot hop into the movie and start watching. I just wow. can't. Right. Uh, mm. and, and it's and yeah, I I'm sure I will if I needed to for some reason. Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, you know just sort of being in the candy factory or whatever, uh, that was enough. I, Keith, I don't I know. Thought, how to... I thought this was going to go positive for Temple of Doom there for a second. I did I... too. I... <laughs> Now well, I, I'm, I'm, I have all kinds of questions about uh, about this now because I so what when was the last time you actually watched Temple of Doom then I mean because uh, like if you, straight through it would have been 1988 or no wow. 87 87, 87. Wow. yeah that wow. was that was when that was and uh, by the way just to put a, a final coda on the story uh, uh, the uh, the guy's parents did wire him a bus ticket from the uh, motel they were staying in uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> Mooch and I, 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 and so yes, he, the, he, he, he got to go someplace. So I, I feel, I feel. Uh, in fact, I just Googled him for the first time in my life about uh, a week ago, uh, just to see where he was, and uh, I couldn't find him. So who, I, who knows? There's a better than average chance he's an <laughs> IndieCast listener if he listened to if he watched Temple Doom that many times. So Mooch, if you're out there, uh, <laughs> you know the further adventures I, at gmail.com. Let us know you're out there. We'll, we'll. Put you guys in touch. Now we gotta wonder if 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 this guy Mooch, if if when when Crystal Skull came out, if he you know got the DVD, did the same thing. I'm wondering I if he picked up the adaptation and went, "Whoa, I used to this guy's wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I cleaned this guy's I made mean, this guy watch Temple of Doom twelve times. <laughs> I, owe, I owe him some steaks. Um, I'm just glad it was only a 24 hour rental. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. He's really cutting it close, huh? I mean, God. Man, I would have I would have paid for a late fee, man. Just be glad he didn't pay for a late fee and make, make you watch it another 12 times. Hey, we talk about Star Wars. Um, I, and again, Indiana Jones podcast, I'm sure there's a lot of Star Wars fans out there listening. I think we have to just at least briefly go back uh, to a long time ago, 1977, to a galaxy far, far away, whatever theater you saw it in. I, okay, Star Wars, 1977, you love the movie. Am I correct that the, that the comic book adaptation, speaking of comic book adaptations, the Marvel adaptation, was that your gateway comic into, like, the oh, like, yeah. not necessarily Archie's and, and Richie Rich's and stuff, but was that your gateway comic into, like, big-time comic books? Uh, yeah, Star Wars 1 was the first grown-up comic I ever got. Everything before that had been... Uh, Uncle Scrooge, Donald Duck, Richie Rich, something like that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, that was the first real, you know, Marvel that wasn't a Hanna-Barbera comic uh, <laughs> that I had. Because Marvel actually had the Hanna-Barbera license very briefly. It was yeah. strange. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was it. And, of course, the funny thing was I, you know, read the adaptation of Star Wars before I saw the movie. Uh, and that was in part because... Uh, well, the first half of the adaptation came out before the movie, mm -hmm. and then also um, we just couldn't get in to see the film. Uh, there, we didn't have multiplexes. Uh, yeah, it was only engaged in a couple of theaters in town, and uh, you know it, there were you know every time we would go, uh, it would be sold out, and I would have to see some other god awful movie that <laughs> I just didn't want to see. So you know, I still I still bear a grudge against Helen Reddy because uh, I didn't want to go see Pete's Dragon. <laughs> Uh, or, or, or whatever movie it was in the other thing, but uh, it finally happened. And in fact, uh, you know, the Kenobi novel, which you mentioned, uh, you know, check the front page, and you'll find that it is dedicated to my sister, who made sure I got to see the movie. Oh yes. wow! That, I do remember that dedication. Well, there was about a, uh, a there was about a uh, you know a three month period where I was sort of in this weird twilight region of not quite understanding what star Wars was. So <laughs> as far as I knew, uh, the, well, I, I, I knew that the villain's real name was dark invader because I knew that whoever was saying it, uh, just didn't get the name right. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, there was that, uh, and then also, you know, all the little kids on the playground who had been playing, uh, Baba black sheep, uh, as their role play game, uh, and that was a TV show that was on in the in the seventies. Uh, Robert Conrad. 
It was the Robert Conrad mm-hmm. show. Yeah, it was Pappy Boynton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the kids would all, uh, you know, put their arms out and fly around the playground like they were airplanes. Uh, <laughs> everybody stopped doing that and started doing Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And again, I was like, I don't I don't have any frame of reference for this. I, I you know, here I am. I'm I'm you know, I'm at Bougainville Island, you know, uh, and, and you guys are going off to what Alderaan. I don't know what's going on. here. <laughs> You showed them all those years later. What was the like? When did you first realize that you could do this as a gig? At what point did you turn from kid loving comic books to, oh, uh, maybe maybe I should write. Maybe I should write words and and get paid for them. Well, I was writing my own comic series, uh, you know, basically from age six. The same time I started getting comics, uh, I was I was doing my own. Uh, you know, I had my own comics line. There's a, in my you know, news school newspaper from second grade, there's a, an article about, uh, and, and John Miller, uh, of, uh, Miss Chappelle's class has his own comics line. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if this is what tomorrow's kids are going to do, uh, this is a great sign for the future. I don't know. Anyway, and, and, and but, but, uh, and then I, later on, I got a mimeograph or not a mimeograph, but a copy machine. Uh, and uh, was able to actually start sending the books out to people in the what we call the small press movement when we were sending many comics back and forth. Uh, and then when I got uh, you know into college, or uh, I uh, well all during that time I had uh, you know begun to engage in fandom, find out that there was other people that did this stuff uh, and were exchanging these uh, these comics. Uh, I I was subscribing to Comics Buyer's Guide, the uh, the weekly newspaper. Uh, when I got out of grad school, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, I, I went for Soviet studies, which uh, kind of connects to Indiana Jones <laughs> and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I was going to ask uh, you. And- and I got this useless Soviet studies degree, or so I thought it was a useless Soviet <laughs> studies master. All came uh, full circle. <laughs> yeah, this, 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 what I thought was a useless Soviet studies master's degree. Um, you know, I, 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 I worked for a year uh, r- uh, editing lumber magazines, and don't ask me for stories about that because they're just embarrassing <laughs> and sad. Uh, <laughs> But I read, I read in Comics Buyer's Guide that they were looking for an editor for their trade magazine for the comic shops, uh, and I applied and moved up to Wisconsin 25 years ago uh, from Tennessee, uh, and basically during that intervening period, got to know a lot of people with Dark Horse and Marvel and various other publications, uh, and uh, you know, I my first attempt to you know write. Star Wars or Indiana Jones. Uh, I, I wrote pitches for both of those uh, in 94, 95, but I, I found out from Dark Horse that they weren't able to look at them because the Lucasfilm now and, and then was invitation only. We come to you. Oh, uh, and so I ended up not doing anything with either of those until uh, 2003. I, I started... Uh, writing comics for Marvel, I did uh, I did Iron Man. That led to my getting the uh, the Star Wars uh, tryout at Dark Horse, which led to the Knights of the Old Republic series, uh, which was edited by uh, Jeremy Barlow, who in the um, uh, spring of uh, two thousand not two thousand yeah uh, spring of uh, spring of two thousand seven I guess it was uh, got the job. Uh, as the editor of the Indiana Jones line. And in late 2006, I had said to him, hey, listen, uh, we're doing Star Wars now. There's this rumor that's been going around for 15 years about another Indiana Jones movie. If there is one, I want to write the adaptation. Well, he and I were at Star Wars Celebration in 2007, and he said, hey, uh, I got some great news, uh, good and bad. The bad news is we're going to have to shelve this idea that you have for a Ben Kenobi Western, uh, this this graphic novel that you've been developing for six months. Uh, the good news is I have the Indiana Jones office. We want you to write the uh, the uh, adaptation wow. and uh, for wow. Crystal Skull. And so that is the story of how I got Indiana Jones, and at the same time, the novel that would become Kenobi went on the shelf for five years. Wow. 
Wow. That's what I was curious about. If 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 uh, fans who they could have gotten Kenobi a little bit earlier if it hadn't been for Indiana Jones, does that? But that ultimately benefited Kenobi then, right? Letting it sort of uh, sit for a little bit. Well, a it was going to be a graphic novel, right? And mm-hmm. so you know whether it could be told in that amount of space. Mm. The problem was I did three proposals that each one each time I went back and and fiddle with it, it got longer and longer. Uh, and the proposal, the final proposal that I had at Dark Horse that I think probably Jeremy didn't even want to look at at that point was 50 pages long uh, because I had developed the world so much. I, I, you know, we had both said, yeah, this thing needs to be a prose novel or you know something. We don't think we can do this in a graphic novel. The other thing, and of course this is kind of a timely thing to, to discuss now, uh, is that what we uh, were concerned about was that as of around April, May of 2007, that's when the rumors were going around that Lucas was going to do a TV series mm. that would follow episode three. And it would be a live action series. And we realized, you know, we're not going to be able to do anything because um, it's going to collide with all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so that was another reason that we were fearful it wasn't going to go forward. Um, and so it went on the shelf. It did need to be a novel, uh, a prose novel. And uh, I think, uh, you know, waiting the five years until I'd actually written anything for prose and then written, you know, Lost Tribe of the Sith and Knight Errant, you know, that got me, uh, I think, skilled enough that I could do Kenobi and do it justice. And so, yeah, there's a reason that things happen the way they did. However, certainly at the time, the hope had been, uh, and one of the reasons that I did Crystal Skull was, I hoped, and Jeremy hoped, that this would lead to more uh, uh, miniseries, would lead to more stories, or a regular series, and I had hoped to write one of those, but uh, as it turns out, they only got one miniseries out, and I can't even remember the name of it, but I just know I didn't write it. Yeah, I think that would be the Tomb of the Gods, right, Joe? Tomb of the the Gods, yeah, the Tomb of the Gods, and then we we had a couple of those, like, like, little digest... uh, yeah, Indiana yeah. Jones adventures things that were kind of cool. Um, exactly. Yeah, Keith and I talk about this on, on the the podcast all the time. Is the fact that uh, Keith, you know, we this is a two issues two issue series, and it was uh, going to be four. It was going to be four, by the way. Okay. Ah, wow. <laughs> and and that's and that's why if you wonder about the breakdown between uh, what Luke did and what Cliff Richards did, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's probably what happened. My guess is that maybe they gave the fourth part of it to Cliff uh, or third part of it or something like that to do to keep it on schedule. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what what happened was uh, what they had been doing at the time with the adaptations for, for, imp- uh, for episode one, two, and three is they had been putting them out in four issues weekly in the month that the movie came out. And for whatever reason... And this must have been decided reasonably early. They decided that it was instead going to be released in two issues instead of four. And the reason I say that is I don't see when I look through the issue where the break is between part one and part two and part three and part four. Well, you know, that's something that Joe and I uh, have talked about uh, when we've been reviewing the Dark Horse stuff recently, because we feel that like some of those stories could have had a few more issues uh, to breathe a bit and and be like, okay, there's a lot more story here. And then there's some there's some um, series where they just go on for too long, and you're just like, what is? Go- why can't? Why why couldn't they have gotten rid of like just total like you know complete pages? Um, I kind of feel like after rereading Kingdom of the Crystal Skull that. I think two issues is pretty good, especially knowing the movie. Like it feels like, I mean, of course there's, there, there, there's some things that have been taken out, some things that have been added, but I do feel as an adaptation, the two issues really work for this story. Um, whereas some stories could, you know, can use maybe two more issues or some stories could use two issues less. I feel that for, for crystal skull, two issues worked for me. What do you guys think? I mean, uh, we're going to have a fun time reviewing this when we get around to it, because I think yeah. we're going to come into a major disagreement here. I, I, you know, John, I don't know what you think, but I, I like, Four. My thought was four minimum. Well, uh, remember, remember these two issues are forty-four pages each. Yeah. So, uh, so it's it. It was going to be an. It was either going to be. It was going to be an eighty-eight page story in two issues or four. The, there mm-hmm. would not have been anything added. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about um, your relationship with Lucasfilm at the time. Obviously, you know, you're dealing with a lot of Star Wars stuff, too. What were you able to do? What were your conversations like with Lucasfilm regarding this franchise? And if you could sort of put that in the context of your 2018 conversations with the current <laughs> version of well, uh, Disney it, slash Lucasfilm. Uh, in, in 2007, uh, you know, that was when Knights of the Old Republic had been out for a little over a year and uh, the sales were really high. The other thing that was going on in my life is I had quit my day job. Uh, in uh, in March of that year, I had stopped working for the magazines. That's when I launched the Comicron website, uh, and uh, that's that's when I was taking on assignments wherever I could find them uh, to you know, sort of you know, convince my wife that I could do this thing for a living. And so uh, you know that that it was in that period that uh, you know I I pitched uh, and got the Knights of the Old Republic uh, handbook. Um, also at, uh, at that same event in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, that's when I was approached to first consult on the Knights of the Old Republic campaign guide for the role-playing game. And I said, consult, heck, I'll write the thing. Uh, and, uh, cause, uh, again, I, had, you know, I had some role-playing background, uh, and, and, you know, I had also proposed another Knights of the Old Republic, uh, spinoff. Uh, comic series that never, never actually came to fruition. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was clear to, you know, Dark Horse that I was willing to take the extra work uh, and that I really wanted the work. And also, you know, I had, uh, I guess, gotten a rep at Lucasfilm that I was dependable and, uh, you know, not going to uh, set the internet ablaze by saying something wrong this way or that way or something, whatever. Although I don't, don't know how this mooch story is going to go over. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but but anyway, uh, you, you, so we had a day and a half to read the script. You know, we got uh, we got a few hours uh, each day to sit there and read through the uh, the scripts and uh, make as many notes as possible because we were not allowed to take the scripts home. And, uh, you know, it was. It was kind of funny going through the scripts because we would uh, hit different things at this at different moments. So, uh, you know, I I think uh, I I I I hit the aliens and I said, oh, and Jeremy <laughs> said, what? And I said, wait for it. And then he got to that page and he said, oh. And then later on, he gets to the nuked refrigerator and uh, he says, oh, and I said, what? And he said, wait for it. And then I got to the refrigerator. And so I said, oh. And so, you know, uh, I, I think we came away from that uh, wondering how in the heck we were going to get it to fit. Um, and uh, you know, I think the uh, you know, I, I think my notes deteriorated as the uh, as the story went on simply because. Uh, it, you know, we had been in there for many hours, but also it's really hard to convey a lot of what happens in a movie like this in a script. Um, it, it is, you know, just try describing the ancient city sequence to somebody else uh, in in Peru, in, 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 in that movie, uh, and have it make a lot of sense. Uh, what saved me uh, was that they provided uh, a lot of uh, you know, visual material later on. Uh, they, uh, I was able to look at the production drawings of the ancient city and everything like that. Uh, and I knew that the artist would have them as well. You know, then, as I say, the, 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 the more difficult stuff uh, and I, and I did struggle with it was just little scenes like Indy in the warehouse where he, uh, you know, fires the gun or has the gun go off, uh, you know, runs, grabs the whip, uh, you know, leaps from box to box, leaps onto the back of the, uh, of the, uh, the open, uh, cab, uh, uh, vehicle, uh, and, you know, battles the, the guys there. Well, that's like five, six, seven different actions in one, you know, one little fight sequence. Uh, and, you know, one of the rules that I was still learning back then, and, and in fact, uh, my, my editor's boss sent me notes on this book, uh, you're reminding me of Joe Orlando's rule that there can only be one action per panel. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, and this takes. I mean, that 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 scene that you just described takes up basically a page and a half. It's rough. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, the 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 uh, you know the jungle sequence. That's another one where, you know, if I were writing combat in a comic book that was you know freeform, where it was. Yeah, uh, Indiana Jones and the uh, Room of Many Hats. Uh, <laughs> Fedoras. Which, yeah, there we go. <laughs> if I were writing, if I were writing an action sequence there, I would say to the artist, "All right, uh, page seventeen. For the next three pages, these characters are going to beat the hell out of each other." Okay, uh, okay, and- that's where I, that's what I was re- alluding to earlier. These action sequences are so drawn out and so involved. The fight with Jovchenko at the beginning uh, that you yeah. mentioned, uh, the jungle chase, all these different things. They're so drawn out. It almost felt compacted to me. Oh, it was. And so, you, But you're kind of answering my question in the, fa- in the sense that you would let that breathe for maybe three or four pages. Honestly, though, I just want to say quick, too, uh, that, that jungle scene in Crystal Skull isn't the most exciting scene <laughs> in the film. I mean, I'm kind of glad it was chopped out a little bit, to be honest. Look, I mean, I like Crystal Skull for, for what it is, for the ideas it puts out there. I actually like that. But I thought that that jungle scene in Crystal Skull is very uninspired. And it, I think it goes on a little too long, and it's it, quite frankly a bit boring for me. So, <laughs> I welcomed the cut down a bit. John, you know we made I mean? it pretty far into the interview before the the Crystal Skull well, bashing stuff. Well, <laughs> no, look over here. You know I love that. I know. You know I love the movie. I know. You know? I know. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, you've read. You both I read kid. the books. Yes. Yes. I read. Yes. I read. I read. I read the books. I, I wrote the books. I read the books. <laughs> I had not seen the movie. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> if it looks anything like the movie, <laughs> you're golden. It's because we worked our tails off. Yeah. And, it, it and came... all, on top of it was that this wasn't like the old days where, you know, you would get a story treatment or something like that. And the adaptation would maybe sort of, you know, veer off in this direction or that direction. Uh, as happened back then, uh, where, you know, you would have sequences that were written, uh, particularly when they had thought balloons where, Mm. you know, the, where the art, where the writer would be able to, you know, riff for a while on this or that or the other thing. And you might, you might've had, instead of me having 88 pages, uh, I might've had, uh, you know, back in the day, back when, back when, uh, well, well, the adaptation that, uh, that Marvel did for star Wars, uh, was 102 pages. Uh, it was seven, 17 pages in six different issues. Well, I would have taken that extra 14 pages and probably written, uh, I would have aired things out and written little scenes in between hmm. explaining some of the things that needed to be explained. Yes. Um, because, uh, and I'll get to this, uh, but there, there are always things that you can elaborate on or whatever, um, but the practice after episodes one, two, and three at Lucasfilm had been, they wanted to try to have as little differentiation as possible between the adaptations and the books themselves. Uh, because all the time people were saying, wait a minute, uh, 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 isn't Ben Kenobi Obi-Wan's brother, uh, or isn't uh, Owen Lars Ben Kenobi's brother or something like that? Because again, mm-hmm. that was the writer uh, going off of, I don't remember how what, I don't remember what uh, what James Conn was was referring to back then or where he got that idea, but that was obviously something that, that didn't that didn't appeared get in the there. in the Return of the Jedi novelization. That it um, did, yeah, yeah it did. right, right, right. But where where he got that idea, I can't mm-hmm. remember. Well, okay. you uh, okay. you walked us right into it. Here's the thing, Keith and I love the fact that when we get these adaptations and we think about like Temple of Doom, we think about Raiders, you know, especially Raiders. You get the submarine scene and how he how he escapes, you know, on the submarine. We love those deleted scenes. We love those things that, you know, maybe you saw in the script and you put in. Keith, let's talk about something. I'm going to let you go first on this. Um, Let's dig into some of these scenes because there's a lot of stuff that's actually in the book, not in the movie, that I really love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm wondering if you've caught them all. (laughs) Well, Keith, (laughs) Keith, I'll let you. uh, Keith, you you start. You're uh, go. You go for it. All right. Well, there's there's definitely one that uh, sticks out for us that we've talked about many, many times uh, on the IndieCast. And that is the scene uh, of of when 
when uh, Mutt and Indy are being chased on the motorcycle and oh, yeah. uh, by That's the Russians, it. and and they get uh, they're, you know they're, they're they're going through the uh, the 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 university campus and they drive uh, across the football field and it's very you know in the novelization in in Rollins's novelization uh, that that scene plays out even even more different than than what you have in 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 the comic book where Indy actually catches a pass from the quarterback. Oh yeah. It was, it was about five minutes of film and, okay. And I don't think that I was told that it was cut. Uh, and I don't think they knew that it was cut. I think though, that as you can see by the book, when I was doing the breakdowns, I said, you know, this is crazy. This is wild. This is rollicking. I only have a page for this. And this is the when you're when you're facing something like this project, what you have to decide is, okay, here's the stuff I got to get in. You know, right. these are the these are the conversations that I've got to get in. And then this leaves 30% of the book for action sequences. And then it's a thing of, well, uh, you know, which ones am I going to do? You know, the, there's just uh, you, know, you just have to make those decisions. Just like when you're making a film, you have to make a decision of what will fit. Uh, and I don't know why, but I guess I decided uh, at the time, hey, I don't, I don't have room for all this, but I've got to establish uh, this stuff. And you'll notice that it's in moments like that that my narrator shows up. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so, um, and it, well, I love I love the Last Crusade reference uh, that 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 takes place. Uh, over that 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 panel where it says uh, because while the pen may not be mightier than the sword, New Hampshire granite General Trump's Pittsburgh steel, and that's when we have uh, the Russians' car hitting Marcus Brody's statue, and the entire statue falls onto the car as opposed to just the head falling into their lap, um, which I think uh, plays a little bit better in the comic book adaptation where where, where the entire yeah. statue falls over. I like that much much better. I, I... How, how do you I think, think I intended? I think I intended that, but I can't remember. <laughs> the, okay, I, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna jump in because I I do love the like Keith said the Last Crusade line. I'm guessing that you were inspired by Last Crusade with that. I've got a little problem with you writing New Hampshire granite, generally Trump's Pittsburgh. Still, I'm from Western oh, Pennsylvania. No. <laughs> oh no, uh, Mr. <laughs> Miller, I can we. I can't <laughs> I'm not sure where I got that line from because I'm not sure I would have known where that where where the steel came from. I, yeah, I don't. I have to go back and look. See, here's one of the things because the steel also... breaks the statue. Okay, <laughs> so let's the car's still intact. Joe yeah. is a big Pittsburgh Steeler fan. He is the biggest Pittsburgh Steeler fan I've ever seen in my life. So that right. I knew reading that that was he was going to take can, an issue with that. So can we can we all <laughs> agree that Pittsburgh steel is stronger, but that Marcus Brody trumps all? Okay, well, I, I all I can tell you is that uh, I was born a Dallas Cowboys fan, and uh, uh, I, although I have explains lived for, your line, then I, I have li I have lived for twenty five years in Wisconsin, so I am by by law a Green Bay Packers fan these days. <laughs> <laughs> I probably meant no slight against Pittsburgh, but uh, uh, you know, if you want to take that as payback for Super Bowl thirteen, go ahead. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, I but, look here. Here's the thing. I there's one thing I really like in here, and there's a line you drop in. It's uh, it's when Indy's at the house there, and the, he's like getting ready to just leave. He's been fired. Um, there's a line that you put in here that was uh, maybe it was in the original screenplay. It, it certainly didn't make it in the movie. At least I don't believe that it did. But I think it plays through the entire comic, and I'm wondering if this was intentional. Where um, Charlie's mentioned, he says, "I wish you had met someone like my wife, or did you meet her already and not realize it?" And there's this great shot by by Luke Ross there where Indy just sort of reflects and he's kind of looking at this and then that just sort of plays out all the way through to the ending where he gets married um was that, oh, that in was, the, was that in the original screenplay that line cuz i don't think um, it was in the movie right keith um well i i do remember us talking about um that that scene was going to be that that scene definitely was going to be uh in the movie where where Indy is looking at his jacket and coat and stuff like that or was it shot or even in the novelization too yeah. and it and it got cut and i feel that that was just a major mistake because yeah. you know that's that, that's a theme that should have run through the movie yeah that's a um, character but they decided beat. Yeah, that that is a character beat where you know you're following Indy at a, at a certain point in his life, and they just kind of you know then they you know instead they just go with that goofy shot of him looking at you know the shot of uh, Sean Connery from Last Crusade yeah. aboard the Zeppelin. And you're like, what are they doing the here? Shot. Yeah, John, was that uh, yeah. was that in the screenplay, or did you intentionally um, try to get that romantic um, I, element in? 
here's what's a couple of things here. A few things are in play here. One is that I didn't actually write down the entire script when mm-hmm. I was, you know, working on it. A lot of what was going on was they would match this. They would alter or match my lines to whatever was in the final screen or what in the final shooting once they had it uh, at the final in the final go run in the final pass. So there are a number of cases where, uh, you know, where I do have the exact lines from the movie perfectly, that was Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so, so you have that. Uh, The other thing that was happening uh, was that about uh, halfway through the process, I got the young adult novel uh, because that was done. Mm, And so whoever was the author of that, had had more time to sit into the room, or actually, they had already done the process of putting in the lines for the movie. So that was another case where I was matching up what was what was in more. So the more interesting question is what things are in, uh, what things are in common between the novel, the young adult novel, and the and the graphic novel that has something to do with the order in which they were written. Okay. Um, and as as to the specific what was in that scene, what I can tell you, there was something in that scene that they took out that I had been delighted with and was really upset when it came out. Um, the Dean, and this is canonized because it's in either the young adult or the adult novel, but it was in the screenplay. The Dean's children are named Don and Maggie. Mm-hmm. Don and Maggie are the founding fathers, the, you know, they're the George and Martha Washington of comics fandom. Don and Maggie were the editors of comics buyer's guide for 30 odd years. That was the magazine that I went to look work for. Okay. And I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, David Kep uh, or, or however you pronounce his name, the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the screenwriter. I, I saw that and I said to my editor, that's gotta be a reference <laughs> because <laughs> because in because in comics, you know, for people that are you know, you know have been in for a long time, you know that's that's a that's a that that's a, that's a very famous couple known by known by that uh, like Donnie and Marie. Uh, <laughs> so 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 uh, and and I had even told her about it, and then it didn't happen. Uh, it that line came out, uh, but you know some lines come out. I think one of the uh, what I thought was one of the best lines of the movie got cut out. Although as time has gone on, I'm not sure it's the best line anymore. Um, you know, the uh, when they uh, finished their whitewater rafting run in the Amazon, uh, they uh, you know wind up on the shore, and you know uh, Marion asks him if he's all right, and he says, "It's not the mileage; it's the years." Yeah, I wish that would have stayed in. I that was in I, the I, that was in the original yeah. screenplay, right? That was, and it might have been in one of the other books. I used to think it was, uh, you know, it. I, I wondered if it had been shot. I used to think it yeah. should have been in the movie. Should have been. I now think it's too cute by half. Yeah, um, you know, I think they, I think they wanted to take out a lot of the references to his age in the movie, which I do think is, is. I mean, yeah, you don't want to ever go over I, the top with that kind no, of stuff. No, it's. I, 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 I can't, that's I, that that's line, one of though, my favorite. That's, that's one of my favorite parts of the of this comic book adaptation. So I'm glad it made it into yours. Me too. Um, is, to is me, it in that because I, I thought it came out. It's in no, yours. It's, it's, it's a great it's image. There. It's a great visual. It's a great gag. It's a great callback. And to me, that's worth the price of admission alone to this book. If you don't yeah, have it. That that okay, shot right yeah, there is it, perfect. It is in there. It is yeah. in there. Yeah. The, the the interesting thing is, you know, because of the nature of this kind of project, you, there's very little that you know you get to add. The only place where I'm really present is in the narration mm-hmm. and what I what I choose to say and sort of my my voice. Um, I I did find a plot hole and I asked them if I could fix it and they let me fix it. And um, as far as I know. Well, I know they didn't. I, I told them to pass it upstairs to the movie people, but they didn't care. Uh, or not that they didn't care, but I can't imagine that they would have cared about what I said because right, it's, right. you know, the, the, those, the movie was probably done by then. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what uh, you know, the, the, the plot hole, which I thought was really glaring, is how does Indiana Jones get his job back? Exactly. I mean, when, after, when, after the guy has been uh, fired for, 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 you know, colluding supposedly with, uh, with with Russian intelligence, right. it gets fired. Uh, yeah, how does all of that? 
you know, he leaves the country essentially. How and, does, and how everybody does he that's get his involved, job back? Yeah, everybody right. that's involved is dead. That that could testify I mean, all, is dead. Well, that's no, right. except for except for his girlfriend, right? His a crazy a crazy old man and his <laughs> yes. idiot son, yes. uh, right? It, yeah. No, I, 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 I noticed that too uh, on, on rereading it. Like you threw that extra line in yeah. uh, about um, with the accounts of his companions corroborated by the government's own investigations into Spalco and Mac. And he returns to find not only his job reinstated, but a promotion waiting. Yeah. So I thought that was great because in the movie, it just, just cuts right to. Well, um, there's, yeah. There, there's no way in that era uh, that. Not with the Red you know, Scare. They wouldn't. No. That they would that would they wouldn't have known that Indy had gone to Peru. Mm -hmm. There's no way that they wouldn't have known that there's basically a, a you know a a, a a mobile Soviet regiment <laughs> <laughs> tearing up uh, tearing up uh, uh, you know Peru. They would have had somebody out there following. Yeah. Uh, uh, to at least see something. Yeah. And so and that could have been an interesting plot point had that made it in the movie. Like, who are they actually following? Are they following India? Are they following the Russians? Are they following both? Like, what's going all on? Of who them. are these They're, guys? The CIA. That would they have been were, great. They were all that over him at the great. beginning. They were they were now, all over him at the beginning. They didn't trust Indy. A terrific reason this is not in the movie is that, you know, it, when you're making a movie, you want the ending ending to be as soon after the climax mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. You so people are going out on a happy note. Yeah. And they're still excited about the film. And you don't want a film that just keeps ending. Yeah. And, you know, if there's a criticism that, you know, I think could be valid against episode eight, it's that it ends five times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, that's that's. That's still okay. I mean, no, it's, it's a good it's... point. It's a good point. You talk about like the narration, and one one of the things I loved about the narration is I get, you get to drop these lines in there. I, w I was curious where this one came from, uh, where you say when Indiana Jones travels, he takes two kinds of vehicles, his and yours. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> great. Are you kidding me? I don't remember that. I don't remember that. That's pretty I great. To I was trying to have whatever fun I could have with it because oh, I mean it's it is. Uh, look, it, it sounds like I didn't enjoy this project. Uh, I, I I did enjoy it, but I understood or was was finding out while I was doing it. You know, what are the constraints of doing these sort of thing? You know, it's it, the the best thing about it is that uh, the movie didn't change mm -hmm. while I was writing it. Uh, nobody came back to me and said, hey, you know, we need to throw out five pages. Can you write this? Um, you know, that's that this this was you know, something that, you know, is more likely to happen when you're uh, doing tie ins with video games and other things uh, where the the game is still in development and they come back to you and say, oh, yeah, that whole subplot that's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. You know, that's I was glad that that didn't happen. Uh, and, you know, I figured out a way to make this be me narrating this story. Um, do I wish that I had uh, had gotten to do. You know, an original story. Sure, I've got, I've got them in the files. Well, I, uh, I, I want to ask I, you about I, that. I want to ask you yep. about that. But Keith, Keith I want to um, two before we get to that. Two of my favorite things are right at the very, very end. But I want to, uh, Keith, if you've got another deleted scene or something you wanted to get in, I want to give that back to you. Yeah, there was one more thing that I really, really loved, uh, which I think brings a lot to the story uh, as well, because it, they kind of don't really touch upon it. And it's left up to the viewer as far as the uh, the film goes, kind of what exactly happened with with that crystal skull. Where did it come from? How did it get there uh, to to Oriana? Uh, and and you basically put in there um, you know, some some close ups of of the um, the Uga cave um where they show i guess a, a painting of 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 one of the aliens with the head removed and that's re that, i believe that is in the movie but it's way way i mean it's really hard to see but i i like that you guys focused on that it gives a little bit more of a background to like you know the conquistadors coming to uh to akator them cutting off the heads of one of the aliens and then leaving with with the skull, and that was um, that was quite prevalent in the novelization as well. I believe the, the the novelization opens up with Oriana escaping with the skull, and I really thought that that brought so much more to to the story and the history of what actually happened. And in the movie, that's just kind of glossed over. It's really all just about like just bringing the skull back. 
not actually how it was taken in the first place. So I really yeah, love I, that. I, uh, you know, I, I don't remember a lot of details on that. Uh, you know, again, you know, we didn't re- know what the crystal skull would even look like at the start. Right, so. <laughs> right, right, right. Fair no, enough. I thought that was a nice touch, though, in the in the uh, in the uh, comic adaptation. And I love the fact that you put a bow on everything uh, at the end here at the wedding. Uh, there's a great line of dialogue that you write in here. It says, uh, "In searching for the kingdom of the crystal skull, he found the greatest treasure of his career," which goes right back to that beginning line uh, that you dropped in. I just I, I just get a sense that you wanted that you thought the Indy Marion relationship was the priority of the book, of the story. Well, I mean, that's that's obviously where it ends, and yep. uh, and you know, it, the, the they it was clear to me that uh, you know one of the thrusts right from the very beginning of this uh, of the story was, you know, is is has has opportunity to have a real life pass this guy by, uh, you know, has has he is he and that goes back to the meeting with the dean and everything else. Um, uh, is this going to be what it's going to be for him? Um, you know, is he just going to be wandering around, uh, you know, telling stories on, uh, park benches, uh, to random people years from now? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wearing an eye patch. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, now, now the other thing that was in here, uh, and this kind of plugged into, uh, you know, my background was the Soviet thing. And, uh, you know, I was having to really, you know, figure out, uh, you know, exactly when this was set and whether I wanted to look smart <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and add little details here and there, uh, because certainly, you know, I, I had, you know, I, I, I had that Russian history element and, uh, I decided, you know, <laughs> let's, that's, we, there's not really a lot of room to be able to do that uh, in, in just narrative boxes anyway. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, who else were going to be your enemies in the 1950s? Right, right. Well, one thing you, you did leave out, I don't know, intentionally or how it happened, but thank you for doing it retroactively 10 years later. Thank you for doing this. Um, you, you didn't give Shia LaBeouf the joke of almost putting the fedora on. Oh, I was just going to mention that. Thank you. Yeah, you left him in the dust. <laughs> he literally I, I left him in the dust as Indy walks away. <laughs> I didn't know about that. I didn't know about the swinging monkeys either. Take credit um, for both of them, my friend. You can, you can yeah, take yeah, 10 yeah. years later, you can take credit for both of them for yep. leaving well, them out. Well, this, yep. is what, this is what was sort of interesting is my <laughs> wife and I went to see these films in, in a double feature. I think this is it's uh, most recent time that I've watched two movies the same day, same theater would have been 10 years ago uh, because we went to see Iron Man and we went to see uh, this. And what was surreal about it was, well, obviously with Indiana Jones, I'm sitting here watching this, you know, beat for beat for beat. And, you know, knowing what should be in or shouldn't be in or whatever. And so I'm not even appreciating it as a movie, really, but sort of watching it as, oh, well, there, there there's that. Um, or where'd that go? Uh, or, you know, sort of going through the checklist. Mm. And of course, the other surreal thing was, you know, in Iron Man, uh, you know, I had written Iron Man for a year. Uh, uh, the uh, John Favreau uh, had uh, been given my year of Iron Man to research the character. He had hired our cover artist uh, as one of his uh, as one of his uh, armor designers. That's Adi mm. Granov. Uh, he, uh, he had pulled a number of characters from the comics I wrote, uh, including, uh, the reporter that, uh, that, uh, Robert Downey chases around the bed in the first movie. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it, it was just, that was just very surreal because I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, that's Christine Everhart. Uh, that's. <laughs> That's the character we had in the comic, uh, and of course that comes up again this summer because uh, uh, my villain from uh, from that storyline is uh, one of the villains in Ant Man and the Wasp. Oh, so oh, that's great. <laughs> nice. That's great. So, Which villain so, is it? Um, it's uh, there's a you know there's always a human uh, regular guy villain, and then there's always uh, the, the metahuman kind of yeah, 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 and and the the superpowered villain is the ghost and the. Uh, the regular guy villain uh, is a uh, guy who, when I wrote him, was a Pentagon uh, a Pentagon chief. Uh, his name is Sonny Birch. Uh, he in 
in the storyline that I did in which uh, Tony Stark becomes Secretary of Defense, uh, he is the Pentagon Acquisitions Chief. He uses uh, patent law to uh, uh, basically void all of Tony Stark's patents on Iron Man uh, because he violated national security by you know using this stuff in public uh, and seizes control of all of the inventions or all the or armor designs. Uh, and Tony Stark decides he has to become Secretary of Defense so that he can be in charge of that guy. Uh, and anyway, that character, I had established that he had worked for Cross Technologies. Cross Technologies came from Ant-Man, uh, and, or at least it was a major uh, company in Ant-Man. Uh, they decided that uh, they were going to use uh, at least the character's name <laughs> oh, wow. as, cool. as the name of the character that's played by Walton Goggins. Well, congratulations for that. That's going to be awesome. Well, whether congratulations. It's a, yeah, that's amazing. Well, whether it's a big role or a small one or whatever, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that character was a suicide by the end of my story, so I have no <laughs> idea. And I don't think he's ever appeared again. But it looks like, once again, they've they've gone to the catalog and, and pulled. <laughs> well, speaking of comic book stories, you mentioned it earlier. You've, you've got some Indiana Jones tales that you're, you're champing at the bit here. Um, okay, so... We know we get, we're getting Indy 5. We know we're getting that. Look, yeah. it's Disney slash Marvel slash the whole Lucasfilm slash the whole world. With they, I can't imagine they're not going to do another monthly title or at least miniseries. I have no idea. Would you, uh, yeah. would you be interested in pitching yourself to write for think, Marvel think, and Indiana Jones again? I think Indiana Jones would be a lot of fun simply because, again, I do have that history background and... Uh, certainly a big pop culture background. And uh, if we're moving into the 60s or, or uh, good Lord, the 70s. Uh, <laughs> I, we get the know, we I, get the Han Solo looking Indiana Jones. He had I the think, feathered hair or something, right? Is that how I it think, works? I think it, would, I think it would be a lot of fun to be <laughs> able to to do that. I mean, look, one of, the, one of the reasons that I like playing in different sandboxes is because there's different toys, but also different things you can, can do. Um, you know, Star Trek, uh, yeah, apart from the fact that the you know the transporter is just story magic, I love it. Uh, it it gets you from scene to scene just like that. <laughs> the other thing that I enjoy about Star Trek is I can actually mention Christopher Columbus. Uh, I can actually mention uh, you know uh, things from Earth's history uh, and uh, you know not have it stricken or not have to you know, reshape it or something. So it, it, it you know, sounds like it comes from, you know, Cosmo the alien or something like that, uh, because it, it's in our universe. Um, and, you know, here again, if I wanted to draw from history for Indiana Jones, I mean, that's, that's part of the gig. Uh, so again, who knows, uh, it, you know, clearly it, it, it's something where, uh, Indy has not been an easy as, as easy as sell, uh, either in novels or comics as Star Wars. Um, it's visual, but not visual in flashy ways uh, that, you know, are a lot easier to, you know, to do in, you know, a space opera comic. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, set on Earth. I mean, it's, it's uh, the setting is a, is, a, is a big part of it. Also, a lot of the mechanics, and I think we've kind of touched on this before, of uh, Indiana Jones-style stories are harder to pull off in comics. And by this, I mean uh, the puzzle rooms, you know, the, the stuff where you have to do this to do this to get this to work. Um, you know, I had, as I mentioned, the hardest darn time, you know, getting that clockwork city kind of a thing uh, depicted anywhere close to what ended up showing up in uh, in Akator, uh, mm. because I had no idea how to show that. You could do something like that in an animated cartoon. You can do something like that in a movie. It's a lot harder when it's freeze frame, you know, a slideshow without getting the narrator in there and and whatever. Uh, and so yeah, there there are reasons why you know some things, some story devices work. And some don't. And in fact, you know, that kind of thing is really hard to do in prose. I mean, you know, mm. he, he moved the rock and then the library book fell out and then the ceiling started to drop. Yeah, that's real hard. And so. Um, so then do you get away from that? Do you 
Uh, okay. What, what's, what's what your you pitch? would do? What's your what you would, what's your pitch what, for indie indie six or what, what? Well, what what you would do to you you don't get away from that in in uh, obviously the you know the movies are the movies are the movies the way that the things that make Indiana Jones exciting and good are are the things that make it good. What you do is you play to the strength of each medium that you're in. Um, one of the things that Star Wars comics have going for them is, you know, we can draw as many aliens as you want. Uh, and you don't have to worry about paying for all the costumes. Uh, and so we, we can do the giant splash page scene with hundreds and hundreds of spaceships and lots and lots of aliens. And, and, and that gets done. Uh, that's, that's, that's part of, that's part of using that to its advantage. Um, you know, and, you know, we've learned over the years how to do things like, uh, like space battles properly. It's harder though, to do a number of things like, for example, car chases, you know, you, you, you look for the kind of stories that are easier to tell. And one reason that superhero stories are easier to tell in comics, you have characters being muscular and hyper extending and everything else like that. Uh, you can convey action, uh, a lot easier, uh, on the comics page. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, what you would want to do is look for, uh, the things that are, uh, uh yeah, that each particular, um, you know, format is, is more suited for in novels, for example, you would just beat the heck out of the history, uh, and the philosophy and the politics, and you would get into a number of these other things, uh, about, okay, how did Indiana Jones get through customs going from country to country to country? <laughs> uh, you know, you would, you would look at that kind of stuff and you would have a lot more dialogue, a lot more conversations between characters. And again, that both of those things are kind of poison for comics in comics. You would look for, uh, well, how can we tell a, 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 an adventure story that, um, you know, does not rely on, things that are difficult to draw. If Marvel re-ups the Indiana Jones comic book franchise for their adventures continued, you know, beyond that, would you be interested in writing that? And if so, what would be your pitch? I, I was interested before, right? <laughs> as far as what the pitch, <laughs> as far as what the pitch would be, uh, you know, I, I kind of keep that stuff under my hat cause I might use it one day, uh, or I might use it for something completely unrelated. Can you give us, well, you mentioned you've got some Indiana Jones stories sitting there in your filing cabinet. I, well, I, I'll tell you that the story that I, I, I proposed, uh, or was going to propose was actually a re uh, you know, this is back in the nineties. This was a reinvention of the story that I did uh, for my own character back in the eighties, back in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I just whipped a lot more history on it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it was something that would have taken advantage of that time period, uh, which is pre-war in that period where everybody's walking around with fedoras in the late thirties. Uh, and world war two is, uh, if it's happening, it's happening only in Europe. We're still in the phony war stage as they, as they called it. Uh, you know, it's, we're before the invasion of France. Again, what you do is what you do with Indiana Jones is you go out and you find a, um, you know, a historical object to art, uh, or you make one up and, uh, you figure out a way to, uh, make it relevant to, uh, a modern political problem or a contemporary political problem at that time. And then you decide whether you're going to whip a little, uh, magic on it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you don't have to, uh, and, uh, what I liked about the Further Adventure series was the whole format of, look, it's all going to be two-issue stories. We're going to have a cliffhanger in the middle. And what we're going to do is every storyline, we're going to highlight a different subsidiary character. So it'll be Captain Katanga, or it'll be Jock, or it'll be one of the other characters, or Sala. And I, I liked that a lot. I mean, it's it's uh, I think it's harder to do a real serialized serialized. And when I'm talking serialized, I mean, you know, a 30 issue Indiana Jones story with subplots and things going on. I think it's harder to make that sale because we never saw that on screen. Right. We, we, we never saw Indiana Jones, the Netflix series where, you know, 
we've hidden a traitor in the cast for for you know for six hours for six episodes or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, you know, we 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 haven't seen that, and so uh, you know, doing something like that that'd be interesting. Um, you know, putting the character in the middle of some big kind of story like that where it's not all about the MacGuffin, I think it'd be interesting. I don't know that it would work uh, because it's not what people are accustomed to. I don't know. Uh, that's the sort of thing where everybody says it would be fun to try and, you know, maybe we should. Keith, I think I just made a friend. I, he's uh, This is the first time I ever heard somebody say it's not all about the MacGuffin. <laughs> <laughs> right, it, and, and and that's 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 how we see things here. So you fit right in with us. Well, I mean, the MacGuffins well, I mean, drive me nuts because they're MacGuffins. It's like I want to see the well, I want to no, see the dude, right? We're yeah, we're, exactly. we're running we're running out of them. Yeah. Um And right. and uh, and look, what what do we what do we have here as as the basis of of the story? We have the base. We have the the notion, at least in the 1930s, is that. Hitler is a nut about this stuff. Yeah. Well, that means basically, you know, anything else you want to come up with uh, that could be, you're, you're intersecting archaeology and metaphysics with, uh, with uh, you know, World War II history. And that's where we got many, many, many stories Yes. Where things get more complicated is when we're moving forward. And uh, for, if they just hop one decade to the 60s, mm. you know, I'm not sure what you do uh, uh, or who the villain is or whatever. I mean, uh, you know, how how this series coexists with Vietnam. Uh, you know, this is this is this is what this is what gets dicier the further ahead you go <laughs> is you get into time where things are increasingly on tape. Uh, things are increasingly on video. Things are increasingly within people's memories. The, the, the later you get, the less magical time is. What have you got uh, that you're working on now? More in the world of Star Wars? Uh, the most recently out, I did a, a Star Wars Adventures uh, annual that just came out. Uh, that is my first Luke and Leia story, which is pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, that uh, is in stores now, and... Uh, Boy, that thing just flew off the table at Free Comic Book Day because it wasn't it wasn't free, but we sold a lot of them <laughs> at the places I was at. Uh, because that's the book that has the return of Jackson in it, the rabbit from the original Star Wars. Oh, movies. excellent. So go get your copy if you haven't already, because it'll be a conversation piece, if not a collector's item. As for new material, um, got two things, uh, really three things I'm working on this week that I cannot say anything about. <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. Uh, this is one of those, uh, one of those, uh, phases where, uh, you know, I have more, uh, uh, more that I have that is unannounced than, than I can actually say. But whenever you can announce it, we will find out about it on farawaypress.com. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, also JJM faraway is my handle on, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, just John Jackson Miller on Facebook. And then I, I have been doing a lot of stuff. I've actually started a, I started a, a video channel on YouTube for, uh, for my comicron.com website, uh, where, you know, I do talk about comic sales across time, both in the past and in the present and get into some of these, uh, you know, frequently asked questions about why comics are the size and shape they are. And, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of answering some of the, the, you know, the, the, the things people just always have wondered about why comics are the way they are or, or, or stories are told the way they are told. Well, John, you are certainly involved in a lot of different worlds. Keith and I and all the listeners are so thankful that you got involved in the world of Indiana Jones. Uh, this is a fun adventure. We're, we're glad we're glad to be celebrating 10 years of it with you. Happy 10th anniversary again. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us here in the Raven's Nest. And uh, I think Keith and I are just going to go uh, watch watch Crystal Skull again and, and uh, read the comic book. We're going to we're going to watch it 12 times and Mooch will, <laughs> Mooch, Mooch will be over in about 10 minutes. So, uh, uh, and, yeah, and, 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 and I think Mooch, Mooch just walked into the bar. <laughs> I was going to say, Mooch, if you're out there, uh, you know, you don't have to pay me back for that jolt cola. OK, uh, we're, all, we're all good. Well, Keith, I don't know about you, but I am now looking at this comic book adaptation in a whole new light.
Yeah, me as well. You know, I, when I read it just to um, just just uh, in preparation for for that interview, um, you know, I hadn't read it probably in about 10, almost 10 years. Yeah, since the day. Since, yeah. since the day. And I just, I mean, I have to say, I, I think I might even like the adaptation a bit better than I like the movie. Ah. It, you know, <laughs> you, we, got, we got no monkeys. We got no monkeys. We got no. a cut down uh, jungle chase. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of, uh, you know, th- things that are, that, are, that are slightly different, just like what we talked about. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed rereading this comic once again. And it was great to talk to John Jackson Miller about the process and, and of course, to hear about uh, our buddy Mooch. <laughs> <laughs> Mooch right. He's got to be out there, right? Mooch He's has got to be listening. out there. Mooch, contact us further. Uh, further adventures at gmail dot com. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to be well. Let's we let's get a, we'll have a reunion with with Mooch and John Jackson Miller. Yeah, maybe he can uh, help him restock his fridge or something. Uh, that's right. That's as long right. as he doesn't nuke the fridge, that's all. It is. <laughs> <laughs> He nuked John Jackson Miller's fridge, apparently. He did nuke, yeah. So. There's a theme here. There's a full circle theme coming up here. So, well, all right. That's, look, that's our look back 10 years of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That was fun. Um, Keith, okay, it's coming. We're going to, Sargasso Pirates, we're going to be talking about this. But the, the next time folks hear from us, man, it's right around the corner. It's another anniversary celebration. Yeah, that's right. This time it's our anniversary. Yes, it is. It's going to be the seventh anniversary of the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones on the IndyCast. Woohoo! Is it, I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I'm feeling really old today. So. Yeah. <laughs> it is the years. years. It's not the most. Oh, seven years of oh, yeah, yeah. No. Oh my goodness! But look, we I promise. Found, hold on, I just found another gray hair. Let me get that. Yep, and uh, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, it's we're getting there. So look, we promise we are <laughs> going to be getting to. We are going to be getting our pirate on with Sargasso Pirates. We might even have a surprise guest lined up for that one. Another surprise guest. We might be hanging out in the Ravens and us here a little bit, so stay tuned for that. And, folks, get your thoughts into us, man. Drop us a line. As Keith mentioned, the further Adventures at gmail.com. Do you got thoughts on Crystal Skull? Do you have thoughts on Sargasso Pirates? Do you like the, the series? What do you think of it? Give a review. Uh, seventh anniversary wishes for further adventures. If you want to talk about anniversaries, you want to send along uh, some anniversary wishes to us, we want to hear from you. Absolutely. And please be sure to check us out on Facebook at the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. And yeah, looking forward to hearing from all of you guys out there. Okay, that's it for the day then. Well, as Andy says, we've got to wrap things up here. Keith, as always, a pleasure getting together and knocking back a few rounds in the Raven's Nest with you. Uh, so glad we got to do it for real last year, though, in New York City with the rest yeah, of the exactly. Looking team. forward to the next time, whenever yeah. that may be. Hey, Indy 5. Indy 5, that's when we got to do it. We're talking get them 2020, all together right? We've got a couple of years to get ready for that one. But uh, we do, we do, but always always fun getting together with you. Man, that's going to be fun getting together, though, for the 7th anniversary of the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. In fact, next time we're going to be sailing the seven seas with Sargasso Pirates. We're going to be celebrating seven years of this very segment. And that is next time on the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm.